<laughs> All right. So we were talking about grasslands and how grasslands are dominated certainly by grasses, but during the spring months, grasslands turn into these forb lands. They turn into these habitats that are really characterized by forbs, which are flowering, non-woody plants. They're not shrubs. They're not woody. They don't have tissue that snaps. They're things that are pliable, that can be fleeting year after year as annuals, or can persist for longer periods of time. Um, gold fields are classic in more dry habitats where the soils tend to be a little shallower. They make these blankets, these beautiful blankets of yellow on the, on the hillsides, but um, they look like a lot of other things. Gold fields here up close and personal, classic little sunflowers from the Asteraceae, the sunflower family with the disc, oh, excuse me, the disc florets right in the middle and these ray florets or ligules around the edge. Each one of these petals, each one of these ray florets and each one of these interior tiny disc florets are individual flowers that produce a single seed. And that's again, classic of the Asteraceae family. So gold fields look a lot like monolopia, again, making these beautiful yellow blankets on the hillsides. And to really check to see what, you know, what the difference is, you have to get up close and personal. To my eye, there's a very subtle yellow tone change. I have a, a really poor perception of light and dark. I don't know if that's cones or rods, I can't remember, but I, I have a really acute perception of color. And again, I don't know if that's cones or rods, but um, I see a very subtle tone difference in the yellow of these two flowers. Now, monolopia to me is a little brighter yellow. And if you look on these ray florets, it has these three little toothed notches. I mean, it's really cool. You don't see that unless you get really close and take a, a very, you know, long look. But you can, uh, you can make the mistake of, seeing, uh, of thinking monolopia or the um, lasthenia of the gold fields uh, are in this image here, but no, this is the non-native weedy field mustard, brassica. And again, And it's, and again, all members of this family have petals that are radially symmetrical. There's only and always four. So yellow hillsides, a different kind of yellow called the footsteps of spring. Um, one of the very earliest things, and they are out now, uh, footsteps of spring up close are really complex. And I wish the slide was even a little crisper because the leaves are these highly dissected, very complicated individual leaves that collectively are in a rosette. They're around the clusters of flowers. Just a really compact, low to the ground. Uh, you easily you know, step right over them. And if you get down on your hands and knees and look, you go, whoa, that's a complicated thing. <laughs> I, I dig that. Lots of yellow in the environment. This is um, a wildflower that's also an early one that is out now. Sun cups. Sun cups, just like the footsteps of spring, come from a rosette, a basal, or at the base, a basal rosette of leaves. These are really cool. They're in the primrose family, and it's kind of hard to tell. Um, but the primrose family is characterized by these little pom-pom pistils. See how the female pollen accepting part of the plant called the stigma 
attached to the pistol, which goes down to where the seeds are produced, is the capitate tip, more like a capitate. Think about a head. <laughs> and it's a little round capitate stigma. Now, when the pollen hits that stigma, it's transferred all the way through the tubular flower, actually down underground where the seeds of this plant are formed in the ovaries. Very interesting kind of life history, probably an adaptation to herbivory, to being munched on as one of the earliest showiest things to appear in the grasses, attracting attention, if you will, potentially from herbivores. But the seeds are really interesting in that they're actually fully matured underground. So it's like an instantaneous seeding. And I really have no clue how they're distributing, how they're moved around, maybe by gophers or moles or something underground that's uh, churning up the soil a little bit. Another really cool yellow wildflower, a flowering forb, is the Johnny Jump Up. It is a true violet. And there are a number of violets uh, in our local flora, uh, the Johnny Jump Ups. They're just so cheerful. I don't know, they're just really neat. I really find these streaked pathways interesting on the lower portion of the petal. These streaked pathways are observed by pollinating insects with their very complex eyes in almost a, um, you know, different kind of, of uh, spectral way and it guides them into where the pollen needs to be distributed. It sort of leads them down in. It's a pathway or a signpost, if you will, leading them down into where the flowers are pollinated. Another yellow one, <laughs> California buttercup. Lots and lots and lots of stamens in here. It really likes sort of moister soils, which is typical of the family, the ranunculaceae. And just like the field mustard, ranunculus California buttercup is the sort of most distinctive member of that family, the ranunculaceae. More yellow, tidy tips. Oh my gosh, yellow fringe with white. These are cheerful flowers too. And they also have these really interesting notched ligules or ray florets. These are members of the Asteraceae, like sunflowers, and it's sort of a mini sunflower. These are really distinctive because they have this white margin on all these ray florets, all these ligules. It's very cool. I've seen white um, tidy tips actually mixed in, and those are color morphs once in a while, and we'll talk about that in a minute with poppies. Once in a while, you just see a different color or a different slight mutation of the number of petals. We'll talk about that in a minute, too. This is a non-native species, Matricaria pineapple weed. Um, it's a member of the Asteraceae that doesn't have the ray florets. It doesn't have the you know, she loves me, she loves me not, petals. Uh, it only has these disc florets in here. And it looks like a pineapple. It's very small. It likes disturbed areas. And if you think about it being adapted to disturbance, you know, you all often see it along trails or road margins or something like that. Your feet just kind of roll over it without mashing it too bad. It's kind of resistant to that disturbance. But if you pick one of those little pineapple shaped flowers and you mush it, you scrunch it up, it really does smell like a pineapple. It's kind of, kind of interesting. Anyway, it's distantly related to chamomile. Um, it kind of looks like chamomile that you make, you know, the calming, soothing tea out of, but uh, it's not a true chamomile. Ooh, it's not white <laughs> or it's not yellow, I mean. Um, Little onions that occur in grassland habitats. Uh, this one is very small. It's very rare. And it occurs in the coastal grasslands, the remnant, what we call coastal. 
was. So I need to work out who he You're was. breaking up just um, a little bit. Uh oh. Okay. I wonder. Oh, it told me my internet connection is unstable. Not good. I can hear you now. Uh, you know, <laughs> if I turn my video off, sometimes that actually helps. Okay. That'll be fine. Hello there. Mm. I can hear you now. Okay. That's a little better, huh? Yeah, yeah, it's much more clear. Okay, good. I, I turned my video off and sometimes the bandwidth here where I live is, is kind of um, shaky. But back to this onion, it's diminutive. It's only max three inches tall and it nestles, it hides in between grasses. So it's very challenging to see. It's quite rare. Um, but we do have pretty interesting concentrations, uh, believe it or not, in the grassland areas around Carmel and in Pebble Beach. If you were to dig up the bulb, you would definitely smell onion or crunch the leaves a little bit. You would definitely smell onion. It was an important food source actually for the Native Americans as well. Botanists have a sense of humor. <laughs> this plant, botanists thought, looked like an onion. It looked like an allium, the genus, but it wasn't. So this plant they named the reverse of allium or muilla, <laughs> which is kind of goofy. Um, so it just you know, demonstrates to me that the botanists were having a little bit of fun with this. Looked like an onion, but it wasn't. So they named it the reverse of an onion. Instead of the genus Allium, it's Muilla. And when the anthers mature with the pollen, when the pollen is absolutely ready for dissemination, it turns blue. These really interesting paddle shaped anthers have this cool blue pollen that's just super distinctive. It's very, very um, interesting. Again, you don't see that unless you get up close and take a real close look. More purpley things, blue-eyed grass, which is actually not a grass at all. This is in the iris family and this is not the greatest of pictures, but if you look, the leaves are kind of overlapping the way a, a bigger iris would be. So even though they call it blue-eyed grass, it really ought to be called yellow-eyed iris for the yellow stigma here and the yellow pollen on the anthers down here. So I like yellow-eyed iris better than blue-eyed grass. There are a lot of clarkias named after Lewis and Clark. Uh, they collected these on their expedition west. And this is the same species of Clarkia purpurea. It's the subspecies Quadrivolera. But look at how different it is. This one has four very distinctive lavender spots or kind of magenta spots. And this one, the petals are all magenta. So we have common names that distinguish these two. We call this one the four spot and this one the wine cup, Clarkia, but they're the same species and even the same subspecies. So again, there can be color variations. Here's another Clarkia, Clarkia lewisii. Now, how do you tell this one from the others? Well, this one has a nodding bud. See how the bud bends over? They call that nodding. These nodding buds are distinctive of Clarkia lewisii. And when they're ready to fully bloom, they'll turn upright. Then the calyx will open, which encloses the bud and reveal this lovely light pink four petaled flower. Now here's another Clarkia. There's a bunch of Clarkias. <laughs> This one's called the elegant Clarkia. And in my mind, it really is elegant. It's got these incredibly complex um, petals. 
that have this long attachment and then this wide portion at the top. It's just a stunningly beautiful flower and it, it truly is an elegant clerkia. Although the species name, the specific name, unguiculata, it's kind of hard to say, isn't very elegant, I don't think. <laughs> anyway, more pink, calendrinia, the red maids. These are low to the ground. They're beautiful. They're happy little flowers. They have really cheerful little centers, classic array of petals with a white border on the base, again, sort of guiding pollinators towards where all the important stuff is that the pollinators have to deal with. Another pink one that's typical in grassland areas at the margin of shrublands, often right at the margin, the um, the areas that are used as, as traffic lanes for rodents around the margin of shrubs. Uh, Zeltneria davii, Davies centauri. This one's a very small, small plant and usually doesn't have this many flowers on it, maybe one or two. Um, and again, it's right at the margin of grassy areas where there are often rodent uh, beltways or rodent you know, tracks around the margin of shrubby zones. This is a fun one with a fun name to say, Scutellaria, Scutellaria, skull cap. I'm not really quite sure why they call it a skull cap. To me, it looks like, you know, this gaping mouth of some animal. <laughs> it's kind of weird with a tongue that sticks out. And although this is a close up of the flower, this particular flower is probably about three quarters of an inch long. They're very, very small. Yeah, you have to get really close and look if you have a hand lens or sometimes you can turn your binoculars around backwards and use your binoculars as a, a hand lens uh, if you don't have one to get really close to take a look. <clears throat> Beautiful larkspurs. There are many different species of larkspur here in our central coastal areas, often in grasslands or in grassy openings in the oak woodlands. Uh, very interesting complex flowers. There are three different species here on this slide. The coast larkspur, Delphinium patens, is the most common. It has kind of blade-shaped leaves. Now this one on the top right, Perry's larkspur, I don't have a picture of the leaves, but they're really, really skinny and fine. They're like threads, very highly dissected leaf that has these individual parts that fan out, but they're thin, they're thread-like. And this one, the Hutchinson's delphinium, this is also quite rare. It only occurs along the coast and it has a very distinctive white center in the middle of all these petals and what's called a hood, this part here, that kind of curves down. So these are the distinctive ways to tell the different larkspurs apart. Does the, curve, does the hood curve down, like it does, does in this Hutchinson's delphinium, or does it curve up, like it does in the Perry's larkspur? Does it have thread-like leaves, like the Perry's larkspur, or broader ones? like the coast larkspur. So these are all very distinctive characteristics that really determine the species that you're looking at. And you need to pay attention to that if you wanna be, um, you know, a little bit more progressive and a little bit more adept at wildflower identification. This one's easy to identify, baby blue eyes. It's one of the few truly blue wildflowers. And uh, it's another early one. It's coming out now. Um, you know, you often are hiking along and see this at your feet at a distance. If you were to get down on your hands and knees, you'd notice these really interesting veins and all these cool little dots at the edge of the petals with anthers that are shaped almost like, I don't know, elongated chili peppers or something. Uh, but they're tiny, tiny, tiny things holding the pollen. Well, let's talk about paintbrushes. 
Paint brushes are in a family that is um, partially parasitic. All paint brushes are deriving a portion of their nutrients by parasitizing the roots of another plant. The bracts, these very showy orange things that are modified leaves, the bracts are orange. Yeah, there's a little bit of chlorophyll in here. Chlorophyll is the pigment that helps plant in the presence of sunlight and water produce its own food. There's a little bit of chlorophyll, so it's producing some of its own uh, food, but the bracts, these showy bracts, are distinctive amongst the family of plants that are in this partially parasitic group. Now, if these showy things are the bracts, these funny, diminished, elongated things, these are the flowers. <laughs> these are the flowers. You usually think of flowers as being the showy part of a plant, but in this case, it's these bracts. Now, how do you tell the different paintbrushes apart? Part of it is what part of the county are you in? You know, what kind of environmental context are you in? What sort of habitat or vegetation type? This one is typical in grassland areas. And it also is really hairy. Look at those fine hairs, sort of bristly even when you touch it. So all of these things are taken in context, help you identify. Now these two look superficially the same, but they're not. Mechanella versus platystamen. Mechanella doesn't really have a common name. Platystamen is cream cups. Now, how do you tell these apart? They're white and yellow. Yeah, this one is, you know, white petals. This one's sort of half white, half yellow. That's kind of, mm, that can vary from plant to plant. This one's half yellow, half white. But look at the inside. Look at the stamens. Look at these male pollen producing parts. See how the pollen holding anther is sort of, I don't know, shaped like a thumb. But look at those. Those are weird. They're shaped like little paddles inside the center of this plant. I don't even know where the pollen is held on the cream cups. I mean, somewhere in there. So you got to really look down inside. Same with these, the fiddle necks. These are kind of cool because they're arranged in what's called a cyme. That's the inflorescence or the collection of flowers. These are all individual flowers that grouped together in the inflorescence create this cyme. And we call this, in fact, a scorpioid cyme because it has the look of the tail of a scorpion. And I've been uh, stung by scorpions twice and it is no fun. The first time, in fact, I thought I was gonna die. <laughs> it's pretty crazy. There are a number of fiddle neck species. This one is Msinkia menziesii, named after the Scottish botanist Menzies. Some have very deep orange centers. Some have small flowers, big flowers, you know, some are super bristly like this one. They're quite variable, very common in grassland areas. As are, of course, our poppies. Now, California poppies, hmm, state flower. You could call it the state forb, but it is the state flower. I love these. I have a bunch in my yard. Now, we all know what a California poppy looks like, but how many of us knew that there was a different kind called a tufted poppy, which superficially looks really similar. Tufted poppies, environmental context, tend to be in drier habitats. And look at this, at the base of the petals, at the tip of what we call the peduncle, which is the little stem that holds the flower, there's no collar like there is on the California poppy. Huh. This is classic diagnostic 
of the California poppies. And really the only way to tell if you're looking at a California poppy versus a tufted poppy is to look underneath and see if this has a collar and it doesn't. So this is a picture of my front yard a number of years ago when I just let all the poppies in my yard go crazy. I pull them up now because I have too many and it just gets to be too much of a jungle and I can't tell snakes are under there and all that stuff. But in May of 2014, superficially, you look at my front yard and all these look orange, right? They all look orange, but they weren't. When I got down there and prowled around and was looking for snakes and stuff, <laughs> I saw that some were sort of almost two-toned orange. And I had the more typical pale with orange center of the maritime variety as well. I'm about 12 miles from the coast. I do get a lot of fog. Um, I'm, I'm about at a thousand feet elevation, but this I thought was unusual to see the maritime variety. And then tucked in there, I had weird color morphs. There color is ever so slightly different for some bizarre reason. All these four colors were in this mass of wildflowers. And I think the pink color was, um, I can't really remember, but I think the pink color was closer to my, um, my fire thing there where there was a little bit of pot ash, which is really rich in the mineral potassium. Maybe that was actually changing the soil chemistry ever so slightly and uh, giving rise to different colors. Now, a couple of years later, I found these side by side, right next to each other, white flowers, a white color morph, right next to the typical standard orange California poppy. So don't be fooled by that. Now we have a number of different members of the poppy family in our region. We have bush poppies, which grow, oops, which grow on um, shrubs. We have fire poppies, which come in only after fire for a couple of years, and then they're gone. They're a fire, fire follower that literally only lasts, you know, a couple of years, and then they're gone, overtaken by the vegetation that was originally there, it grows back. And then we have wind poppies, and I've only ever seen these at the pinnacles, but all of these are members of the poppy family, and they can be found in grassland and sometimes in shrubland areas where you find the bush poppies. There are a lot of bush poppies in portions of the Santa Lucia Preserve and some of the higher, more inland um, areas, higher elevation. Now, just like we can have color morphs, we can also have variable petals. Uh, I was hiking on Garland Park and I happened to notice that right in the same patch of wild blackberry, there were these typical five petaled flowers of the wild blackberry. That's what you always see. But then I saw this variable 10 petaled right in the same patch. So there was some slight mutation that caused the petals to double. And this might be ever so slightly genetically distinct. I'm not sure. So these variations do occur naturally in nature, you know, doubling of petals or the changing of colors ever so slightly. So let's talk about lupins. Oh my God, there's so many lupins. Ah, geez, and they're so hard. Um, these are easy. These are shrubs. You got the yellow bush lupin, the yellow tree lupin, or the silver bush lupin, very distinctive. You have both of these on the Santa Lucia Conservancy. These are big bushes. These can be my height, you know, five, five. Here's a person on a California Native Plant Society walk looking at this tree lupin, this yellow bush lupin. Oh, but right next door, we found a pink one. It's like, okay, is this a color morph or is this something distinctive? Is this a hybrid? You know, what's going on here? There were purple silver bush lupins back here and yellow tree lupins right next door, but we found this pink one. And I don't know what to think about that. It's stunningly beautiful. I'd love to have something like that in my yard. Purple stuff, owl's clover. 
a member of that same paintbrush family. And superficially, it looks like one. This taps adjacent plants, probably grasses, for a little bit of nutrient. Now we can't confuse those with clovers. Those purple owls clovers are a totally different genus, a totally different family, but they look superficially like true clovers, which are members of the legumes, the Fabaceae, with their Uh, ternate or trifoliate compound leaves composed of three leaflets. Now, clovers are cool. They're very hard to tell apart. This one's a little easier, the pinpoint clover, because these parts, which are technically called involucres, are pointed, just like little pinpoints. This one they're a little broader. So the little part that holds the inflorescence, that holds all the little flowers, this one's pretty distinctive. Pinpoint clover. And for some reason, that's off the side of my page. So again, superficially very similar looking yellow bulbs or geophytes, the golden brodea and the golden star. You look at these from a distance, you think, oh, they're all the same thing. But no, you got to get in there and look closely. Look at how on the golden star, each petal is divided all the way to the bottom. Here's a close up. Each petal is divided. It's separated all the way to the ovary here where all the seeds are being produced. Now in the golden brodea, the pretty face, it's hard to tell from this particular picture, but the petals are only separated to a certain point then they join together in a tube that's kind of hidden down in here. So they are separated at the top, but then they fuse together down below here into a tube. And, you know, they all have this umbel shaped inflorescence, the collection of flowers that's all originating from a common point like an umbrella, but very distinctive individual flowers. Very distinctive individual flowers on these mariposa lilies as well. They're all in the same genus. They all occur in grassland areas, but this really cool one, very complex weeds mariposa lily, this only occurs in serpentine soils. The uh, state rock of California, very toxic, <laughs> high in heavy metals. A lot of other stuff won't grow in serpentine soils, but this particular mariposa lily does. It's very interesting. So color, environmental context, what your soil is, what habitat or vegetation type you're in, all of those things are clues that help you identify plants. But there's no, you know, no getting around having to look up close and personal at how interesting these blue anthers are versus how interesting these spatula shaped anthers are with these wild tepals going out to the side. It's just really, really cool. There's another member of that same genus. It's not a mariposa lily, even though it's the same genus. It's a fairy lantern or a globe lily. And rather than an upright flower, it has a pendulous or drooping flower. These are gorgeous. You often see these in oak woodlands. They like a little bit of shade um, right at the margin of grassy areas. Just a, a, just a beautiful, beautiful flower. And I've seen pink ones of these. I've seen yellow ones of these. So there are color variations. Here's a cool one. This is actually not native to California. The windmill pink or catch fly. It has all these really stiff bristles, but look at the base of the flower here. Oh my God, with these stripes. It's just so distinctive. It's, you can't mistake this for anything else because of how these stripes are just really prominent. And you know, they probably serve a function. Um, this is part of the calyx, part of the bud that encloses the flower. Um, why they're so distinctive, 
there's a reason somewhere <laughs> in the evolution of this plant. But we often do see this in our grassland areas. It recruits readily, doesn't even need disturbed areas. It just seems to thrive here in our California climate. Two plants that superficially look alike, the sky lupin and the Chinese houses, they're actually in different families all together. The Chinese houses are really cool with these two-tone flowers. Now lupin have two-tone flowers too. And as we talked about last week, or maybe the week before, I can't remember, when the tips of the keels here, or maybe those are the, yeah, the keel and the banner, when the tips of these are white, it signals to pollinators that it still needs to be pollinated. When the plant is done being pollinated, the tips turn lavender. So it's telling the pollinator, be efficient, don't come to me, I'm done. Go up here to where the white is. It's very interesting. Thistles, there are a lot of non-native thistles, but a lot of native ones as well. This one, cobweb thistle, very distinctive. It's got really interesting cobwebby stuff that grows around under the inflorescence. This is actually a member of the Asteraceae, just like the sunflowers and the gold fields and the monolopias and the little plant, the pineapple weed that looks like chamomile. But Thistles are in a different tribe and they only have these disc florets down in the middle here. They don't have the petals or the ray florets, the ligules. And if you've eaten an artichoke, an artichoke is a thistle, non-native, cultivated, a Mediterranean native, but we have really cool native thistles as well. Cobweb thistles, very distinctive, easy to tell apart from the non-native ones because of all this cobwebby stuff, which probably shades the plant to some degree when it's too hot, or maybe retains moisture in a little envelope of humidity around the plant. I'm not really sure what that cobwebby, thready stuff is all about. So if we move into a different habitat out of the grasslands and the oak woodlands into more interior, higher elevation, mixed evergreen, redwood and riparian forest or streamside forests, here's a picture looking deep into the Ventana wilderness from Botcher's Gap, which is a forest service camp at the end of the paved Palo Colorado road, sort of the gateway into the national forest. Unfortunately closed right now, the road actually is um, undercut and it's been closed for the last couple of years. Here's the notch in the horizon that's called the Ventana, which is how the Ventana wilderness got its name or Ventana in Spanish. Looking out over a variety of habitats in the canyons along streams, the riparian forests, you have flowering trees. Yes, these are flowering trees the black cottonwoods, the flowers. These are female as well as male flowers. When they're pollinated, each individual seed is carried away with this fluffy stuff on the wind or with the wind to a location where it'll eventually germinate. There is called cottonwood because all this fluffy stuff when it is disseminated into the air looks like floating cotton. A lot of people are allergic to that. Same thing with the willows. They have very similar inflorescences, in this case called a catkin. When the seeds are mature, they're wafted away on the breeze, carried by their cottony uh, distributors. I don't know what else you'd call those. <laughs> Parachutes, maybe. Um, it's a flowering tree. We don't think of that as having flowers, but they do. Madrones certainly have flowers. These are Typical classic trees of higher elevation, uh, mixed evergreen woodlands. They are in the same family as the blueberries, the huckleberries, and the manzanitas, the ericaceae family with their classic urn shaped or bell campanulate shaped flowers. And indeed, they produce berries just like huckleberries and blueberries and manzanitas do. 
really interesting peely thin bark. And when you touch the cambium here of the tree, it feels cool. Uh, it feels cool to the touch because the water transporting vessels are right below the surface. It's really cool. So flowering trees, I mean, you gotta look up or you see them on the ground after they're finished. I love madrones, they're stunningly beautiful. The bark is evocative and the trunk structure is complex. Uh, I had a friend who lived in an area where he had a big madrone and he put this metal Buddha in there and the tree grew around it. And eventually this hole became a beehive. <laughs> It was kind of interesting. So you didn't want to get too close. Uh, flowering trees, another one, buckeyes. Buckeyes are really cool. They have this pendulous catkin kind of arrangement of flowers. This is the inflorescence, incredibly fragrant, just amazingly fragrant. When the flowers mature, not all of them will be fertile. The fertile ones will produce this nut called a buckeye. Interestingly, the nectar of the buckeye is toxic to the European honeybee. Uh, so this is pollinated by native bees and flies and is actually toxic to the native honeybee that makes the honey that you know we put in our coffee or in our oatmeal or whatever. It has a very interesting compound leaf made of one, two, three, four, five leaflets, all coming from one common point and held on the plant with a petiole. I love these trees too. They shed their leaves in the summer um, and are just starting to bud out now. Oaks, you don't think of oaks as having flowers, but they do. They have dioecious, or excuse me, uh, monoecious uh, tr uh, plants. They have male catkins, male staminate or pollen producing flowers on the same trees as the female acorn producing or pistillate flowers. Look at how long and dangly these male pollen producing staminate catkins are. These are black oak in this case. Well, you don't see them, but underneath in just a very few scattered locations are these tiny diminutive female flowers. They are not showy. They're very small. Their pollen source is right on the same tree, right near them. The pollen is wind distributed. So all it has to do is blow up a little bit or blow down a little bit to reach these female flowers. These are really hard to see. You know, think about how many acorns a tree produces, an, an oak tree, they don't really produce a that many, um, but each one comes from one of these goofy, tiny, little, nondescript flowers. Bay trees, typical in the mixed evergreen uh, forest, also have flowers arranged in an umbel the inflorescence, all these individual flowers originating at a common point, very pungent leaves with lots of alkaloids and terpenes. Um, people try to use this in cooking and it's stronger than the Mediterranean Bay that you put like in spaghetti sauce or something, or too pungent. I tried to make ice cream out of these once and I used like 25 leaves and I basically poisoned everybody. <laughs> It was too strong, it was too menthol -y. and we all got intense headaches. I should have used five leaves instead of 25, but bay leaf ice cream, if it's made properly, it's really good. So things that you see deep under the forest canopy, things that you see in redwood forests or in very dense, shady, mixed evergreen forest habitats, things that need to be showy and bright to attract pollinators, bizarre stuff like the fetid adder's tongue, which is flowering now, it's almost done. Uh, very complex. It does smell horrid, absolutely horrid, with these guides for pollinators to get down in there. Things like Clintonia, it doesn't really have a common name, it has to be showy and bright to stand out 
in the shade of a redwood forest, as does the two-eyed violet. This is classic in redwood habitat or in very shady habitat. Has to be bright to reflect whatever ambient light is around to attract a pollinator or be brilliant in color like the Douglas iris or brilliant in color. This is hard to see, um, this Dudley's lousewort. This is super rare. This is a California threatened plant, but um, a same, the same family as those paintbrushes and the owl's clover, it's partially parasitic on other plants. Here's your trillium, yay. Two different kinds, the trillium ovatum with the white flowers and the trillium chloropetalum with the purple flowers. These can grow side by side in a forested area where there's enough shade, um, very distinctive. I think they're actually pollinated by ants that go down in there, but this one may be pollinated by some insect that is attracted to the, uh, to the white. Things that are toxic to be careful of, the um, poison nightshades, they have beautiful flowers. Look at this one, the purple one with these little green dots in there, or this white one, the Douglas nightshade with these really interesting reddish margins at the base. Nightshades are all members of the tomato and potato family. Some people have allergies to tomatoes. Uh, they have little tomato type or almost tomatillo type fruits. And these are highly toxic. Uh, after touching them, you should wash your hands. Another deep forest plant. I wish this was a little clearer that you would walk right by the saxifrage, but it has really cool red anthers that, you know, just a, this pop of color against the white petals. White petals, these are coming out now, the Fremont star lily. Toxicoscordion is the genus. Toxic, you see that word, and scordion is onion-like in Latin. So this is the toxic onion-like plant named after John C. Fremont, Fremont star lily. Here's another white, tiny little plant, hooded ladies tresses. It's a orchid type. And the genus name tells us something. We talked about this two weeks ago, spiranthes. These flowers and the inflorescence spiral up the plant, they twist up the plant. Why have that arrangement? Well, if they were one on top of another, they would block the sunlight from the one below. So as opposite leaves are often arranged, they slightly are offset as they go up and down the plant so they don't shade one another below. Another white orchid, or actually two different species of white orchids, how would you tell these apart? Superficially, they look the same. Each little individual flower, this is about the size of my thumbnail, is a perfect little orchid shape. These have funny little hoods that curve up, whereas these have hoods that are transverse or sideways to the stem of the plant. You gotta get close to really see. Cool things, um, rare peonies are almost done now. Chocolate lilies deep in the forest. Specialized habitats, these vernal pools in grassland areas where water tends to be perched in big puddles for periods of time, very specific soil environment, tend to get these rings of flowers that include rare things like this, which looks like a dandelion, the marsh scorzonella. You gotta look at the base to see these beautiful maroon colored streaks on the bottom of the ligules. Interesting things that occur in vernal pools, again, a very rare woolly marbles. You see why they get their name. They're tiny, tiny, tiny flowers. They're probably the whole plant, no bigger than two inches tall. And then one of the many Heliotropiums, 
uh, has a really goofy name, Chinese pusley. I don't know what that's all about. But Heliotropium has another one of these curved, cyme-like um, inflorescences where the most mature flowers, and then they kind of go into the buds at the base of the inflorescence, or actually the tip. Now, I think this might be the last slide. Everybody knows that poison oak is out there. Poison oak actually is not to be reviled, it's to be celebrated. <laughs> it has beautiful flowers, beautiful tiny little white flowers that when they mature produce berries that are really important as a food source for a bunch of different birds, particularly sparrows. So yeah, I'm not keen on poison oak. I have a slight allergy. I'm not hugely allergic to it, but I appreciate it for its lovely um, flowers. Okay, so are you guys burned out? You want me to try to do a few pictures of, um, of fire stuff? What do you think? I don't know. A few, okay. Yeah, let's do, yeah, it. let's do it. Okay, let's do it. All right, now I'm going to share my screen with this one. Hopefully that'll work. We're at 6.30 almost, but that's okay. We'll just go really fast. Um, where's my favorite symbol? There we go. All right, so yeah, fire, after the fire, this is, uh, a subset of a presentation I did a number of years ago um, for the California Native Plant Society, right after the Soberanas fire, which was 19, six, or 2016. Um, quick illustration of different fires that have happened in the Santa Lucia. You know, they occur relatively frequently, and this doesn't even have the 2016 Soberanas fire or the 2020 uh, Dolan fire superimposed on this image of the Santa Lucia range. Fire is typical. This was a slide, I'm not going to dwell on it, that indicated how many lightning strikes created fires versus human ignitions. So fire is something we live with. Even back to 1910, this map very generally shows fires that had occurred within a decade of 1910 on this San Lucia region. This is a really old map from 1880, which was a fire census. And look at our area, Central California here, the San Lucia range, darker indicated having more fires within a particular time frame. And I don't know what that time frame is. This map came from the Stanford Map Library just the other day. Um, and it's a picture of a, of a screen of a, of a computer. But look at how dark our Santa Lucia range is. Lots of fires. Now plants in our area are adapted, the California floristic province, to Mediterranean climates, summertime drought, wintertime wet. Summertime is when we tend to get fires when plants dry out. Typical pattern for much of the California floristic province, even up in the north where we get a lot more rain. So there is a, a seasonable, seasonal variability. Um, you know, summer times, not enough rain. Winter times, rain. So there's seasonal variability, but there's also annual variability like this year in our Mediterranean climate where we're not getting a lot of rain. So climate variability and seasonal drought has created patterns patterns that are predictable. Here's uh, Santa Ana wind conditions, which blow from east to west, generally high pressure in the Great Basin, creating wind flows that blow offshore, classic fire regime, which is the pattern and the periodicity, the seasonality of fire, creating um, actually ash layers out in the Channel Islands in this case that were uh, collected in soil samples and analyzed for the timing of fires that happened over hundreds and hundreds of years laid down in the sediments offshore. It's fascinating. I'm not gonna talk about that one. A lot of different adaptations to fire. Um, these are redwoods. All of these are redwoods here. 
You know, they have thick spongy bark that's relatively resistant. They, after they burn in the center sometimes, can grow around fire. They sprout readily from epicormic buds that are adapted to fire. So there are things we see in plants like these burls of stored energy that re-sprout after fire. You see these arrangements. This happens to be a, a madrone. You see these arrangements of multi-trunk kind of features off the same tree that uh, are a response to disturbance. Could have been a little wood rat or a deer nibbling on a sprout or a fire. Burls again in Manzanitas. This is a road cut where these big burls were showing and these are stored nutrient um, factories that re-sprout after fire. So all these things tell us that plants have adapted to fire. In this case, more recently adapted species adapting to climate changes, but climate changes that include fire, these are obligate seeders. They will not sprout. Their seeds are germinated by a combination of the chemicals in the smoke, as well as having light in a non-competitive environment where other plants aren't crowding them out. So plants are not adapted to fire as a physical force per se, but the fire regime, which is the frequency of burns, the intensity, how hot burns are, the seasonality, predictably in our areas in the summer and fall, and the spatial pattern. Um, these are low intensity fires, right? High intensity fires are all consuming and different vegetation types are adapted to those sorts of fires. Here on Choose Ridge, after a high intensity fire, there were still patches of vegetation, but a lot of dead standing fuel. And in this area, after a fire, were liberated plants to re-sprout. In this case, uh, Yerba Santas, the smooth leaved and the fuzzy leaved one. These are real indicators of fire. Um, plants were liberated to re-sprout, like this coffee berry or these yuccas, which sprouted just fine. They're adapted to a fire regime. We often get these fire followers that have these just massive displays of color. Again, they're liberated. Their seeds are liberated from having competition, from having a lot of woody debris or thatch from the grasses. Uh, their bare mineral soil has been fertilized with potash, again, um, rich in potassium. We get massive displays of flowers, including this really cool one calling a har called a harlequin lupin, which is a classic fire follower, um, magenta and yellow. Beautiful displays of masses of color. You know, the, the Ceanothus resprouts and just is vigorous in its color in, of this particular species. This is a cool one, Facilia grisia. This is a real fire follower. This does not happen unless there's been a fire. And look at these super thin tissues in the petals. They're almost like window panes. It's a really delicate, delicate plant that will only last for a couple of years. It'll grow, set seed, die. The seeds will you know, germinate the next year, but then maybe not again for, I don't know, till the next fire, 10 years, 50 years, 80 years. The soil seed bank holds all these secrets and treasures. Diplicus ratania, this one too, doesn't grow unless there's a fire. Tiny little monkey flower, tiny little thing. Uh, Calendrinia breweri, one of the um, red maids, a species that again only comes in for a couple of years after fire. This makes it automatically really rare. This one sometimes you see uh, in disturbed areas, the golden eardrops. It's a member of the poppy family. It's more shrub-like. Look at those lacy poppy-like leaves and these just bizarre flowers golden eardrops, a fire follower, as is this, Douglas Facilia. Looks kind of like baby blue eyes, 
but it isn't. <laughs> and even in the Douglas uh, Facilia group there, there were some white color morphs. So don't let the color throw you. Here's a goofy one, flat to the ground, a kind of pussy paws, calyptridium, great name, kind of fun to say, calyptridium, um, succulent almost, with these, you know, leaves that excrete fluid uh, when you crush them. It's got a lot of moisture in there. And again, it only grows after fires. And things show up after fires that you would think make it. Gopher snakes, uh, reptiles like horned lizards, you know, they burrow underground and, and have their own mechanisms for withstanding fire. This is a, a, a hole in the ground, what makes going into fire areas uh, challenging. Um, this is actually an area where a root burned and smoldered for a long period of time, a trunk actually, with roots that smoldered that created these cavities underground. So stuff to watch out for. More common things like crimson sage can become incredibly vigorous after a fire. These are crimson sages in a burn scar after um, the 2008 Basin Complex fire just really proliferated because their soil had been fertilized with ash. This is a real honest to God fire follower, Facilia brachyloba, short lobe Facilia, that just like the other Facilia with the window panes in the um, Facilia grisia with the window panes in its petals only shows up after fire. Two years, max, and then you won't see it again until the next burn. Here's a close up with these scorpioid signs, just really cool. The newest buds here, the older flowers here. This is the one that's mature now. This is the bud about to flower. It's really cool. This one too, Whispering Bells, Emanthe. Sometimes you can find this after um, like a trail has been disturbed or something, but it generally is a fire follower. Just really cool, delicate, pale yellow, sub shrub. It can be as big as like a a binder or something like that. It's not, not too big. Colomia, very complex, very unusual, striking. The Rayless Arnica, it doesn't have ligules or ray flowers, ray florets. It also is a fire follow, follower. I don't know if you could somehow distill the, tar, uh, the terpenes or alkaloids or whatever make Arnica gel that you know put on your muscles <laughs> when it when they're sore. Grinnell's Pinstamen, very showy, fire follower. And this one, oh my God, the splendid Wood, Woodland Gilead. This was five feet tall. This was incredible, just beautiful, stunning. Uh, you walk through a field of this stuff and it just blows your mind. This is an interesting one, Kellogg's Snapdragon. I had never seen this until I'd walked in a burn zone. It's sort of a, a twining Snapdragon, twines on other shrubs like this, woolly blue curls, which is not a fire follower, but is more robust after fires. It sprouts readily from a burl and produces these just awesome looking stamens. Look at how they extrude from the flower. They're, they're really incredible. Talk about, you know, wafting around in the breeze trying to get a pollinator. This is a fire follower, the Arroyo Seco bush mallow. It is a shrub, can be sort of woody, really spiny, not spiny, but hairy, I guess, with little bristles. And uh, it sort of dies back after a few years following a fire, but is, encouraged and uh, reinvigorated after it burns. Here's our fire, po fire poppies, Michael Mitchell picture. These were in um, Fort Ord after one of the prescribed burns. Just beautiful, lasted just for a year or two. And this is an interesting one. The bear grass uh, used to be in the lily family. Now it's been moved into the Melianthaceae family, very lily-like. Uh, it reaches its southern extent here in Monterey County. And here in Monterey County, 
only burns, or excuse me, only flowers after a fire, which is odd. It's very common in Northern California and super common in the Rockies where it flowers like every year, but here in Central California, only after a fire. So go figure, there's something going on there. Okay, that was fast, huh? <laughs> All right. 